So we're going to be discussing diagnosis and treating abnormal ophthalmic exam findings. Maybe. So just to start it off, your basic ophthalmic examination, you should watch your patient navigate into the building in the exam room. Then you're gonna start your diagnostic testing, the three main testing we do in our small animal patients. Schirmer tear tests, I do pretty consistently in a dog. Technically, the normal value should be greater than or equal to 15 millimeters per minute. Um, it's not necessarily a reliable test in cats, so we don't commonly perform that. And then we wanna fluorescein stain all of our patients and then tonometry. Normal readings for dogs or cats are 10 to 25. It always varies for our exotic patients, but I say if you're concerned and you don't know if one eye is normal, check the other eye. And if they're consistent and the other eye is not an issue, technically probably shouldn't be a big concern. You wanna check all your reflexes and your responses and then try your best to do some sort of slit lamp or anterior segment exam, and then moved on to the direct or indirect ophthalmoscopy. <clears throat> so we're gonna start kind of on the outside of the eye and then move our way in. So we'll start with different eyelid abnormalities. So I tried to pick a lot of things that had pictures. I don't know. I have to move this out of the way. It's kind of blocky things for me. Here we go. Okay, so for entropion, what we have is an inward rolling of the eyelid. There's different things that this can be caused by. It can be developmental, conformational, spastic, or cicatricial from scarring. The big signs you have are excessive tearing, squinting, redness around the eye, and inflammation of the cornea itself, whether that be ulcerative or not. A lot of times we're seeing it of the lower eyelid on the outside of it, so the inflammation on the cornea itself will be inferior temporally. The treatment of it depends on what your patient is and what you're dealing with. If it's just spastic entropion from an ulcer, you just kind of treat the underlying problem. If it's, again, just spastic and it's a superficial non-infected ulcer, we can always put a contact lens on. If it is an animal less than three months old, typically we just start with tacking. So we do several different vertical mattress sutures to overly emphasize pulling out the eyelid. So putting these sutures on to physically hold open the eyelid. If they're three to six months, it's kind of a gray zone of what you want to do, uh, depending on the breed, how severely they're affected and how much more growing you think they're gonna do. The cutoff for greater than six months is hoping that the animal's closer to full size in the hopes that you'll have more of a successful surgery. So what we do in older than six months is the modified hot Celsius procedure. And that's where you take a crescent piece shaped of skin out and you tuck the eyelid back. So it's like a facelift surgery for the eye. If the candidate, if the patient's not a candidate for general anesthesia, you can use a human hyaluronic acid dermal filler called Elena. Um, works well for some. The issue is some of them develop a granuloma and some it doesn't last long. So we have to consider that. Immediate treatment, if we're referring it for surgery, is getting it on a lubricating ointment to decrease the irritation of the cornea and considering an antibiotic ointment if there is a corneal ulcer present. Oops. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Everything just got a little messed up. Anything okay. we can help with, Amanda? This all went away. All right, are we back on? Yep, we can okay. say. All right, so I don't know what happened. Um, now we talk about medial canthal entropion. So this is a common conformational defect we see in our toy small braid and brachycephalic dogs. It's just that their inner corner of the eyelid is really tight. That within itself can be okay. You can definitely get chronic epiphora or just the normal tearing that owners are seeing because it can't get into that inferior puncta. The big concern we have one is if there's excessive trachiasis causing irritation on the corner surface of the eye, like in this picture, causing the pigment to form, or if the tearing is so aggressive that you keep getting a facial dermatitis. If those issues are happening, then we talk about treatment. If it's just from excess hairs rubbing on the eye, we can do cryoepilation, so freezing and plucking of the hairs. But if it's so severe and we start seeing this pigmentation in dogs when they're really young, we talk about more aggressively doing a medial canthoplasty to try to get the exposure lessened. Next, we talk about dystichia. So when we talk about our abnormal eyelid hairs, we have three hairs. We have dystichia, which are these abnormal hairs emerging from the meibomian gland opening. We have trachiasis, and that's what you get with the entropion when the hairs on the skin end up rubbing on the eye. And then you can also have ectopic cilia. I didn't put that on here because I don't have a great picture of it. 
but that's what you see commonly in like your bulldogs, other dogs six months or younger where they have that abnormal hair that's coming out of the palpebral conjunctival surface poking on the eye. So you keep getting an insolent ulcer in small, or sorry, in young animals. But this picture right here emphasizes dystichia. Those are hairs coming out of the meibomian gland openings. openings. It's very commonly an incidental finding. When I'm concerned about it is when it's either causing ulcers or chronic irritation to the eye or chronic epiphora from the eye. So if it's enough to cause an issue, the options are trying a lubricating gel and just seeing if that will help decrease the irritation or cryoepilation. So freezing and plucking of the hair follicles. You have to do it pretty aggressively. So eyelid depigmentation can occur. That's just a cosmetic issue. It usually comes back after six to eight weeks, but it can be permanent. And the big thing is some hairs can regrow. So sometimes you have to repeat it. Lepharitis is definitely an aggravating thing to treat and it's for many different issues. So the one thing is you have to figure out what is your underlying issue that you're treating and is this something that's gonna be a long-term treatment that's needed or just need to treat once and get off treatment and see if it recurs or not. So different types of blepharitis are bacterial, fungal, parasitic, immune mediated, so uveo dermatologic syndrome or VKH-like syndrome, a focal inflamed meibomian gland or the other glands lining the eyes, or again, just immune mediated inflammation of all of the meibomian glands. Your options are to try to find the underlying issue or to just treat empirically. So if I'm just treating it empirically without more information, I'm gonna start pretty close to an immunosuppressive dose of steroids and taper it, along with an oral antibiotic. My typical go-tos are like cephalexin, clavamox, or cefpodoxine based on size. And then topically, if there are no ulcers, I'm gonna use neopolydex ointment and potentially consider a triamcinolone injection into the lesions or at least into the conjunctiva for a more long lasting effect. Definitely important that these wear an e-collar, but ultimately if the owner wants the underlying issue and wants it treated, then we have to do a biopsy. <clears throat> Tear staining in dogs. I really just put this up because obviously owners could be frustrated with this, but I wanted to make a point that every dog in this picture is a white dog. So it's really just a cosmetic issue when we get just the tear staining. Um, I don't use Thailand powder or anything like that. I know obviously some people say it works really well. It's just the result of the normal tear film coming over. If there are no other issues, frequent grooming, keeping the hair as short as you can right around the eyes is great. I like to use dilute Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo um, and also eyelid and lash wipes tends to work really well. It's what I use for my dog. She gets it right around the face, but ultimately any dog with white hair around the eyes is susceptible to it. Also switching the dog to filtered water can help decrease it. <clears throat> This picture is upper eyelid agenesis. So we see it probably most commonly in our shelter cats when they're really young, they come in, they're missing typically the temporal part of the upper eyelid can be anywhere from 80% or less of the eyelid affected. Um, the issue with this is that you get the trachiasis rubbing on the eye and the chronic exposure keratitis or inflammation of the eye. So there are a few treatment options. If it's not severe and the eye looks okay, you can just lubricate. Next step up from that would be cryoepilation, so freezing of the hairs under general anesthesia. And then the most aggressive, but the most definitive cure would be an eyelid reconstruction surgery. So the eyelid reconstruction surgery would be a lip to lid transposition. So you move the commissure of the lip up to covering the defect of the eyelid so that you get the full coverage of the eye when they blink, everything is covered. Jocelyn, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you be able to disable the waiting room, please? It seems we still have people in the waiting room. Um, I would love to. How do I do that? Do you see a, a participants button? You should be able to disable the waiting room. There should be a disable option. I can admit all. Okay, let's do that for now. Okay. So they can at least get in. Um, okay. You're not seeing an option for the waiting room. That, so I, that was the only option I saw for the waiting room. There should room. be four buttons below the manage participants where you could select disable waiting room. You should see invite, mute me, raise hand, reclaim host. Well, not it reclaim. says invite if I click on it. Okay, well, it seems everybody who was in the waiting room has at least been able to get in. Okay. 
both of you. This should I just, are we okay? Can I? You can just continue. Thank you. Okay. So then we're going to go on to talk about the globe. So when we talk about the globe, we're talking about displacement of the globe or the globe changing in size or appearance. So traumatic proptosis is your sudden forward displacement of the globe, but also in trapping the islets behind the equator of the globe. So that differenti differentiates it from exophthalmus when you're just moving forward in the globe, but the eyelids are still protecting the globe. The brachycephalic breeds are predisposed to it due to the shallow orbit anatomy. So they just don't have a lot of room for the eye to sit in the orbit. T technically, the answer is that there's a poor visual prognosis of about 20%. Obviously, there's some you might see where it just comes in and there's just walked into the door or the dog did something trying to go after the owner. Again, if it's brachycephalic, they typically have a better prognosis if they caught it quickly. If we have a cat or a dolicocephalic breed come in with a proptosis, we get much more concerned. It takes a significant amount of trauma to get it to the point that you can proptose their eyes. You get concerned if the globe is ruptured so that I would say it's not worth replacing. If three or more rectus muscles are torn, that's a bad prognostic indicator because your blood supply to the anterior segment of the eye comes in with the rectus muscles. So if you don't have those muscles, you don't have the blood supply. Hyphema, you're most likely not gonna have a visual eye because there's definitely retinal detachment, but there is concern for globe rupture for that. Facial fractures, again, you're just concerned for more trauma or if the owner's unable to provide long-term care. The issue is you can have long-term complications up to about six months after this. So even if you replace the eye, you can develop a lateral strabismus that's so severe you can't even see the cornea. You can develop dry eye, corneal ulcers, glaucoma, or thysis bulbi, which is the small fibrotic eye. Um, but if everything looks good and you decide to replace it, the most important thing is the post-op care. So I do about three weeks of an oral antibiotic, again, typically cephalexin, clavamox, cefpidoxine. An oral NSAID, if they're a good candidate, I usually go for carprofen. And then when I replace a proptosis, I do a lateral canthotomy to open it up, but then I usually do two horizontal mattress sutures. So with that, we still have the medial canthal area open. So we still consider using a topical antibiotic, even if it's not ulcerated. If it's not ulcerated before you replace it, I usually use neomycin polymyxin bacitracin. If it is ulcerated ahead of time, I typically go for something a little stronger like ofloxacin. They will have to wear an e-collar and they will be in this e-collar for about three weeks until the sutures all come out. So this, I mean, technically is a question, but obviously some of them show themselves easier than others. We have the optic nerve that's ripped and exposed right here. So this one you would not try to replace. And it's just a cool picture. All right, so next we're gonna talk about exophthalmus. So this is when the globe is displaced anteriorly in the bone, but the eyelids are still in the normal position. So typically when this happens, we think that there can be a mass behind the eye, an abscess, just cellulitis, or issues with extraocular muscle myositis or masticatory muscle myositis. Ultimately, diagnostic to get the full answer for this for a retrobulbar mass, you're gonna to wanna to do a CT scan. Um, you obviously wanna do an oral examination too. Most commonly is, a, sorry, for the mass, you can have pretty aggressive masses when you talk about a cat, but dogs typically have more benign mass behind their eye, but the recommendation most likely is still to remove the eye and the mass. Sometimes you can do an orbitotomy and just take the mass out, but it just depends how extensive it is. A retrobulbar abscess is usually more painful. So if you're between mass and abscess, it's not the definitive answer, but a dog with a mass is typically very comfortable and a dog with an abscess is typically very uncomfortable. So with the retrobulbar abscess, they definitely have pain when they're opening their mouth. Um, obviously doing a dental on this dog would be the most appropriate thing, but you could do a CT scan to get the ultimate answer. If I'm seeing them, because again, I'm not doing the dental procedure, I usually start clindamycin and an oral anti-inflammatory medication. Um, cellulitis is also something that you could diagnose off of the CT scan. And then when we talk about extraocular muscle myositis, we're usually seeing that, this is a picture of it right here, young, typically like middle or medium size or large breed dog that just has an acute onset of bilateral eyes that look like they're popping out of their head, they're so swollen. Technically, differential diagnoses should include Neospora, Toxoplasma, Leishmania, and Lyme, although that's not necessarily always needed to be tested for, but if everything fits, signalment, younger dog, doing an oral immunosuppressive dose of steroids and doxycycline is going to help them resolve. If you don't know if it's that or technically masticatory muscle myositis, which those are usually much more painful, 
and the extraocular muscle myositis drugs are comfortable, you can test for the antibody blood test for the masticatory muscle myositis and go from there. Then we talk about enophthalmus, so the opposite, the eyes shrunken into the orbit or pushed more towards the posterior aspect of the orbit. Um, things that most commonly come up are Horner syndrome. So Horner syndrome is the loss of the sympathetic tone to the eye. You get your eyelid drooping, a constricted pupil, elevated third eyelid. You can have conjunctival hyperemia. The goal with this is you want to determine if it's preganglionic or postganglionic, meaning is it coming somewhere postganglionic between the ear and the eye, or is it preganglionic when we're talking about somewhere between anywhere from the chest to the ear itself. To test for that, you can do a dilute phenylephrine response test. So I use 0.1% phenylephrine and put a drop in each eye. The unaffected eye should be unchanged. If the affected eye goes back to normal in 20 minutes, we typically say it's no big deal, it's postganglionic, it should resolve on its own, although it could take up to six months and really no treatment is technically warranted. If there's no improvement, that's when we start suggesting CT, sorry, um, chest x-rays and maybe more advanced imaging. With it aging, you can lose the fat pad behind your eye and then malnutrition. Then we talk about bupthalmus. So bupthalmus is typically, that's the enlargement of the globe, but it's always thought to be an end-stage disease. You can see it with primary or secondary glaucoma, but you can have congenital glaucoma in young animals, and young animals have different setup to the collagen in their sclera. So they can actually retain vision if they're less than six months old with an enlarged eye. The eye's getting bigger to accommodate the high pressure. So young animals are the only ones who could technically still see with an enlarged eye. But we have all of our little kittens and puppies here with big eyes. Um, this dog had actually a rougher bulbar abscess and glaucoma. And this I just threw in for a Cairn Terrier with ocular melanosis. So that's when Cairn Terriers get diffuse episcleral plaques and then the pigment blocks the drainage angle and they get glaucoma. Isis bulbi, that's a permanently blind, shrunken and fibrotic eye. So it's the smaller eye, the third eyelid is just passively going up, typically a result of severe intraocular disease like uveitis, glaucoma, a healed perforation that healed by itself. It's within itself non-painful. Sometimes they're a little bit irritated or injected and need a topical anti-inflammatory. If it happens quickly and severely enough, they can develop entropion that requires correction, just depending on how the patient is doing. And then subconjunctival hemorrhage. So it can be for different reasons. It can be from trauma. So any, if their dog's wearing a choker and like got hit by a car, anything like that. It can also be the only sign of rodenticide toxicity. So if you have a dog with bleeding around its eye, it's definitely important to ask that question so we know if we need to treat it more or not. All right, and we're gonna talk about the cornea. So just a quick picture to go over what we're talking about. So we have the epithelium, which is the outer layer, the stroma, and then desmase and the endothelial layer. Corneal edema, the main causes of that are going to be corneal ulceration, interior uveitis, interior lens luxation, glaucoma, or corneal endothelial cell degeneration that we're commonly seeing, not commonly, the more commonly seeing in our older dogs, chihuahuas, Boston Terriers, dachshunds are the more common ones we're seeing in. The corneal endothelial cell degeneration is more the diagnosis of exclusion. But I have more pictures for them all coming up. So ulcers, we're saying, are they superficial? Are they deep and infected? or are they indolent? So a superficial ulcer, you technically shouldn't be able to see without staining it, but when you see, stain it, you see the nice crisp, crisp edges. Those should heal within seven to 10 days if there are no other issues causing it. But the most important thing with ulcers of any type is determine what's the underlying cause. It might be that there's none and there was trauma, or it might be that there's entropion, there's dystichia, there's trichiasis, there's an ectopic cilia. So that's what you wanna find out. Even though these are not infected, you wanna start prophylactic topical treatment my go-to is usually triple antibiotic ointment, but if they can't do an ointment, I'll use tobramycin. Atropine ophthalmic ointment or solution, at least once in hospital, is usually pretty helpful if they don't have dry eye and they don't have high pressure, because atropine will make those worse. And then gabapentin by mouth, especially it's usually a lot of our brachycephalic reads that seem much more uncomfortable. Any eye that gets diagnosed with an ulcer should have a plastic weed collar. Recheck within a week and it should be healed if there are no issues. That's different from superficial ulcers in cats just because it's most likely secondary to herpes virus. Whenever we have surface disease in cats, we're always thinking herpes virus. For the ulcers, you get the dendritic or the geographic ulcers. Geographic just meaning it takes on a shape that looks like something else. Um, you wanna still do the prophylactic treatment. So I typically go with erythromycin. 
trying to get in three times a day, it's always harder to treat a cat. Uh, that's what people say. And then the antiviral. So sidofavir is compounded in 0.5 or 1%. It is the only topical antiviral that has been proven to work clinic or through research twice a day. So any other of the antiviral treatments technically need to be given like Q2 to Q4 hours to reach their efficacy that they see in a lab. Although I'm sure in clinics, we see it much differently. Um, that's if the, just the eyes is affected. If their eye and, is affected and there is a URI, then I usually use famcyclovir. I don't go as high of a dose as what's typically seen, but I go anywhere from 125 to 250 megs twice a day by mouth for two weeks, just based on if it's a smaller or a bigger cat. Atropine ophthalmic ointment is fine to use in hospital. We typically don't recommend using atropine solution in cats. It doesn't actually have any issues systemically for them, but it drains so quickly through the tear duct that they hypersalivate horribly and it's really uncomfortable to see. I try to also get my cats in e-collars too. It doesn't necessarily happen, but we try. Indolent ulcers are non-emergent, but non-healing, non-infected ulcers. That can happen in any boxer or any dog over five years old. You get a superficial ulcer, but in these areas we have where the epithelium has not adhered to the stroma and it's a loose rim of tissue. If you are seeing it in any dog of under five that is not a boxer, there is something causing it. So if that's the case, you need to find out what's happening. But you get this kind of halo uptake of stain where it's taking up on the epithelium, but the stroma is covering it. When they're referred to me, I do a diamond bird debridement. So that is about a 95% success rate of healing within the first two to three weeks. Um, things you can do at your clinic if you don't have a diamond bird, you can always do a grid keratotomy. I just don't prefer that over the diamond bird because there's more chance of damaging the eye with that. But you can also do a cotton tipped applicator debridement. The most important thing is if you're going to use the cotton tipped applicators, that you definitely want to put paracaine on the eye, but you want to use a dry Q tip and you want to use as many dry Q tips as you need. If you're referring them for debridement and they're coming in to see me or another ophthalmologist shortly, I say don't debride it because I typically wait around at least 10 to 14 days after a Q tip debridement to do the debridement in hospital with us. Even though it's not infected, you still want to treat it as if it was a superficial ulcer, so prophylactic antibiotic therapy, um, atropine ophthalmic ointment or solution. Typically, these guys are painful. They've been dealing it with a more extended period of time. So adding gabapentin, especially after the debridement, and I recheck three weeks later. The big frustration owners usually have with indolent ulcers is that it just takes longer to heal so that people are not, they feel like they've been to their vet a lot and things just haven't healed. Again, it's just that it needs more time. I do not change antibiotics unless there is an issue getting, that it's getting infected or getting worse, in which case you're not gonna debride it. And then serum does not help these technically. Some people use doxycycline, that's okay. It goes through the tear film. So it can help that way, but if it's not melting, it's not technically the most useful. Just getting it debrided and get them on an antibiotic. Now we talk about the more serious infected corneal ulcers. So these pictures are horses, but horses have the best pictures of melting. But when we talk about infected ulcer, any stromal loss is infection. So if you are seeing a dent in the eye without any further magnification or staining in the eye, then with that, you are saying that you have an infected ulcer. You usually get reflex uveitis, you get small pupil, you get inflammation in the eye and white blood cells in the eye, and then also white blood cell infiltrate around it, so a white discoloration. You get this melting coming off of it. I mean, technically you can refer these, but you should definitely start treatment for an infected ulcer. Um, we should always evaluate what was the underlying issue that if it was a superficial ulcer became infected, or was it just that this was a traumatic infected ulcer? I, I will say I really rarely do cytology, but I will off, typically always offer an aerobic culture if I'm not concerned about perforating the eye. But the big thing is that perforation can occur anywhere between 24 to 48 hours. The only exception to the superficial ulcers not being infected, if you have a superficial ulcer, but the pupil is pinpoint, that is about to be an infected ulcer and you should treat it aggressively. So when we talk about treating infected corneal ulcers, if we have less than 50% stromal loss, we can start treatment. If we have more than 50% stromal loss, it's a desmetaceal or perforation or progressing despite treatment, we're typically referring for a graft procedure. But I start with ofloxacin, anywhere from like Q2 hours to Q6 hours, depending on how severely it's affected, and then compounded cefazolin ophthalmic solution. Whenever you have a deep ulcer, you wanna use drops and not ointment, because if the ointment gets in the eye, the preservatives in it can be very toxic into the eye. 
if the pressure, again, if, if you're comfortable taking the pressure because the eye is not too affected, you can start a topical cyclopegic. So atropine, sometimes I do it twice a day for two days and then once a day for a week or so. And then you want to do some type of anticoagulase. So doxycycline by mouth will go through the tear film. And then otherwise you have serum, EDTA, or acetylcysteine. The only reason you want to be using an oral antibiotic is if it's vascularized. Otherwise, it will not get to the ulcer itself. And hypopion within the eye within an ulcer is typically sterile. So it's not necessarily a concern to get an antibiotic on board. Um, E-collar immediately, even if you're referring it, because you don't want it to rupture on the way. So these are just all the pictures I have of infected ulcers. So stromal ulcers up top, where we're getting full stain uptake. And then this is a desmetacil. So you're seeing the ring uptake, where it's not take, stain's not taken up by desmase membrane, but it's taken up by the stroma corneal perforation, corneal laceration, which should be treated just as an infected ulcer. And then we always have the uh, possibility of corneal foreign bodies. So a superficial corner, corneal foreign bodies should just be in the epithelium. After propericane, you can, if you're confident, obviously it's in the epithelium. After you put propericane in the eye, you can try to use hydropulsion. So put a 6 cc syringe with eye wash in it and either put a 25 gauge needle with the needle removed so you just have a hub or an IV catheter to flush it off. But you just have to be careful. You wanna make sure it's superficial because you don't wanna make it any deeper. And then you can have a penetrating or perforating foreign body. Those are more serious and more concerning to refer immediately. Perforating corneal foreign body, you always get concerned that there's lens damage. Before, if there was any lens damage, we recommended immediately going to surgery to do cataract surgery and restore the cornea. Now they're saying if it's less than three millimeters, it's okay to see if you can save the eye without doing cataract surgery, just based on how it'll progress. But no matter if it's superficial, penetrating or perforating, any corneal foreign body to me is treated as if you were dealing with an infected ulcer. Now we're gonna get away from ulcers and talk about dry eye in dogs. So whenever we're talking about dry eye in dogs, we're assuming that the tear production is gonna be less than 15 millimeters per minute. Um, some dogs need more tears, some dogs need less tears, but that's the big cutoff. I have some pictures coming after the slide, but you get the conjunctival hyperemia, corneal vessels, really thick mucoid ocular discharge because you still are making your mucin part of your tear film, but you're not making the watery portion of the tear film to dilute it out. Technically, Optimune is the only FDA approved treatment in dogs, but I very rarely use it. I typically jump right to 2% um, cyclosporin if I'm just concerned about the dry eye. If there's any pigment on the surface of the eye, I typically go for tacrolime is 0.03%. I start with them both twice a day and give about six weeks of treatment to get to the full response and see if the animal will become within the normal tear film. If there is no response to treatment, and there is a wide range of treatment, so tacrolime goes up to 1%. It's, there, it doesn't have concentrations all the way up there, but there's 0.03%, 0.5%, and 1%. Cyclosporin only goes up to 2%. But if we fail using cyclosporin with tacrolimus together and also adding in pilocarpine either topically or on the food, then we talk about doing a parotid duct transposition as a salvage procedure for management for the eye. But we say salvage procedure because that is bringing saliva to the eye itself, which is better than nothing, but has a higher calcium content. So they're more likely to get ulcerations and the issues from the calcium on the eye. So these are the pictures of all the dogs with the different dry eye. So this dog is affected on this side, but not this side, which you can see all of these dogs have that thick kind of crusting mucoid green discharge around the eye, inflamed around the eye, and some are developing pigment on the eye just from the chronic irritation of the eye itself. Pigmentary keratitis technically is not dry eye, but it is inflammate, chronic inflammation on the surface of the eye resulting in pigment deposition on the eye. Pugs are like the stereotypical breed for it where they can have diffuse pigment covering the entire eye and they can still see. You wanna definitely make sure you're controlling any inflammation, but also try to see if the pigment can thin out. So again, tacrolimus seems to be the best option for me to thin out the pigment and control it. I start tacrolimus, usually the pigment starts nasally and then moves across the eye. So I start tacrolimus anytime the pigment has extended to cover any of the pupillary margin. That's when you definitely know it should be started. Obviously if it's covering the whole eye you start it. If you're seeing anything severely affected at a young age, that's when you definitely want to talk about the medial canthoplasty. There is reports of using like the wart remover freezer to freeze off the pigment on the surface of the eye. 
which will work, but it only works for a short period of time. And then the pigment will always come back. And usually, honestly, once you get the pigment off the eye anyway, you see that there's some scarring underneath it and vision is not necessarily significant. And then we talk about panis on the eye. So it's a chronic superficial inflammation of the surface of the eye that includes pigment, corneal vascularization, and it can also impact the third eyelid where the third eyelid takes on a cobblestone appearance. Technically to be diagnosed with panis, we're only talking about German shepherds, Belgian malinois or greyhounds. Any other dog would just be diagnosed with chronic superficial keratitis. But again, in the outer lower corner of the eye, you see increased pigmentation. Creeping onto the eye, you see the pigment and the granulation tissue. These animals are expected to be immune mediated and it's exacerbated by UV light. So I start tacrolimus as 0.03% twice a day, which will be a long-term treatment. If stain negative initially, I start with prednisolone acetate, anywhere from twice to four times a day. I mean, you can see in these pictures, the range of how much it's infected to almost no impact just on the lower corner to cover the whole eye with diffuse granulation tissue. And when it's so severe that it's covering the whole eye, those animals all start treatment, but maybe give them like three weeks to respond to treatment. And then if there's not a significant improvement, talk about doing subconjunctival triamcinolone to get a better control. The big thing is once you see severe granulation tissue on the eye, you always have to be concerned that a differential diagnosis is lymphoma. So you just want to palpate for peripheral lymphadenopathy and warn the owner if there's not significant improvement, it's going to be something to consider. Can you waiting room, please. Can I do what? Check the waiting room one more time, please. Yeah. And just admit whoever is in there. Thank you. Oops. I don't know. There's just the invite button. Okay, there's nobody waiting to be admitted. Not that I can see. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, no problem. Corneal sequestrums are necrotic or dead pieces of corneal epithelium on the surface of the eye. So they can be as large as they wanna be, they can be as small as they wanna be, but ultimately the issue is that it's dead tissue on the surface of the eye. So hopefully the eye does not want it there and it will extrude itself, which if that's the case, I typically just leave them on topical antibiotic until that happens. But ultimately, surgery is the most controlled way to get rid of it. So surgery entails cutting off that piece of cornea and doing a corneal conjunctival transposition, where if it's small enough, we can cut off the affected piece of cornea and move down the normal cornea to cover the defect. Um, some owners will just wait to see if it'll extrude itself. Some won't want to go right to surgery. It's seen more commonly like the flat nose brachycephalic cat breeds, which they have a harder time vascularizing their eye. But if it's comfortable, I'm fine with waiting. If it's uncomfortable, I recommend going to surgery pretty quickly. Symblephron, so this is just to show you some cool pictures. It's abnormal conjunctiva adhesions around the eye. So the conjunctiva got adhered where it shouldn't be, causing sometimes restriction to the eye. The third eyelid might be stuck up, the eyelids might be stuck together. In one case, it's just kind of centrally around the entire eye. It's Usually associated with feline herpes virus at a young age, the eye got ulcerated or ruptured and the conjunctiva came to seal the defect. There's no good treatment for it. The issue is that you don't know what the cornea is gonna look underneath it. So if you start trimming it, you might end up with a worse eye than you started with. And the majority of the time it will go back and it will reseal itself to where it wanted to be in the first place. So surgery is not necessarily gonna get you anywhere. All right, so now we're gonna talk about uveitis. So working our way inside the eye. So obviously there are a lot of signs of uveitis. If it's just related to the eye itself, you're only gonna see eye changes. If it's a systemic disease showing up in the eyes, you're gonna see all your systemic signs. But the big things you're gonna see are the protonaceous material in the eye, decreased pressure within the eye unless you develop secondary glaucoma and a small pupil. So just some pictures of the different things you're looking for with uveitis. So you have aqueous flare, just a hazy kind of appearance looking through the eye, irritable color changes, um, rubiosus irides is increased vascularization of the iris, a meiotic or small pupil, and then keratic precipitates or protonaceous material that adheres to the corneal endothelium inside the eye. The big thing with keratic precipitates is they typically never go away, so it's not necessarily showing you acute signs if the eye is otherwise comfortable, but typically you're seeing it during a flare-up. 
Hyphema is inflammation, or sorry, bleeding in the eye, and that is a sign that there is uveitis. So it's going to have the same workup, but you also have to consider the coagulopathies. The big thing is you have to figure out, are you dealing with just a local ocular disease, or do you have just lens-induced uveitis from cataract, or are you dealing with anything that can cause vasculitis? Even with a full workup, the majority of our cases end up being idiopathic. Um, the workup depends what breed we're dealing with. So dogs, typically CBC, chem, UA, 40X, thoracic radiographs, abdominal ultrasound. Cats, the main concerns for uveitis are FELV, FIV, FIP, toxoplasma, cryptococcus, and Bartonella. So typically we can test for all of those things in like a feline unknown origin, fever of unknown origin panel, or some sort of serology panel through definitely IDEX, I think also ANTAC. You always want to treat the underlying cause, so that's why it's important to at least start a workup. Usually I can get owners to at least do like the blood work testing, even if they don't want to do the imaging. And then what we do is we start prednisolone acetate in the eye if there's no ulcer, anywhere from two to six times a day, depending on the severity. Um, if the pressure is low and not high, we want to start atropine because we want to make sure we're preventing posterior synethia. If the pressure is high, then we have to start glaucoma medications for the secondary glaucoma and not use atropine. If there is active uveitis, latanoprost is technically contraindicated. So you want to be using dorzolomitimol. And then if we've started testing or the owners really aren't up for testing, we start with either a systemic therapy with prednisone, taper, or an NSAID, depending on how severe it is, and doxycycline typically for 21 days. These are all just pictures of sequelae that can happen from having uveitis in the eyes. So you can develop glaucoma with secondary lens luxation. You can have bullous retinal detachment, which is occurring here. This is also a complete retinal detachment. This picture is iris bombay. So the iris is completely adhered to the lens capsule and bulging forward as the pressure increases. This is also lens luxation. Um, this picture is posterior synechia, and this is the development of a cataract following uveitis. All right, um, so that was just really quickly uveitis because just trying to get through as much as we can to look through things. But I wanted to show you pictures of uveal cysts because they can take on a lot of different appearances. They're technically benign pockets of fluid, but if we have it seen in golden retrievers, American Bulldogs, or Great Danes, we monitor them throughout their life because those are predisposed to having conditions where we see uveal cysts and then we also see glaucoma in those dogs or uveitis, so we want to watch them closely. Um, but again, we just got these benign pockets of fluid that can be darkly pigmented or not so darkly pigmented. Um, cats, they look a little bit different, so cats, you get a really darkly pigmented, capsulated cyst right on the pupillary margin. Um, it's typically not, so it's typically differentiated from feline diffuse iris melanoma, but that's more so like concerns on the iris where these cysts are always on the pupillary margin. Uh, then we talk about uveal neoplasia. So again, this is obviously not all inclusive, but feline diffuse iris melanoma is a real concern we have in our cats. The only way to get the definitive diagnosis is to submit the eye by biopsy. But beyond that, we use criteria for malignancy. So we get concerned when they're dark brown to black, when it takes on a velvety appearance, if it causes the pupil to be dyscoric, if there's cells in the anterior chamber, or if the pigment extends to the iridocorneal angle. We get very concerned for feline diffuse iris melanoma. And the issue with that is it has a 65% metastatic rate. So we want to make sure that hopefully we can get on that pretty quickly. Um, optimistically, it's more just a feline melanosis that we monitor. Totally different, typically, from melanoma in dogs. Iris melanoma in dogs is a uh, very low metastatic rate, less than 4%. Usually, we just monitor the eye until the mass becomes so large that secondary glaucoma occurs. And then we take out the mass, and they're typically cured at that point. Lymphoma. So typically, for lymphoma, we have hyphema, fibrin, and like a pink mass, fleshy mass that either is coming from the iris or if it's secondary to lymphoma throughout the body, just ends up sitting in the anterior chamber as a uveitis. We typically say we cannot get an answer from a aqueocentesis or taking fluid from the front of the eye with any cancer, but lymphoma is actually one of the only neoplasias that can exfoliate well enough to consider getting a sample through the anterior chamber. All right. And obviously, I mean, you can talk about cataracts forever. We have hereditary cataracts, diabetic cataracts, doesn't matter if they're well controlled or not. Congenital cataracts, toxic cataracts. Whenever we have a cataract form, I typically start diclofenac or any topical NSAID once a day to twice a day. 
for any lens induced uveitis. If it's a late immature or mature cataract, we talk about cataract surgery. If it's anything less than that and not improve, impairing quality of life at all, then we just talk about monitoring until can potentially progress. Lens luxations. So we can have primary lens luxation, which we're talking typically about our terrier breeds. We can have acute lens luxation where it just happened. It's moved forward. The pressure's going really high because we're getting pupillary block glaucoma, but the eye has a strong dazzle response and potential for vision. And that lens needs to emergently come out. Then if it stays there long enough, which is varies for every animal, we get secondary glaucoma, in which case it's permanently blind and we're most likely just talking about comfort and getting the eye out. Again, the anterior lens luxation, lens move to the front of the eye, typically IOP is over 60. Um, we do not want to be using latanoprost in these dogs. So if it does have a dazzle, we want to refer potentially for intracapsular lens extraction. If there is no dazzle response or the owner can't commit to really topically treating the dog, removal of the eye is most likely in the animal's best interest. We want to start dorzolamide in that eye and might consider options like IV mannitol or oral methazolamide just to keep the dog stable until surgery. Anterior lens luxation is cats is typically always secondary to anterior uveitis. So then posterior lens luxation, we're less concerned about, has less complications. You typically do not go into the back of the eye to get it, so we don't talk about emergency referral. But if it is shifted into the back of the eye, which the lens keeps the iris in a normal position, so when it's shifted to the back of the eye, the iris bows back a little bit, then we talk about using latanoprost at least every 12 hours, and it needs to be given consistently because one missed dose can cause the lens to move forward, but the whole goal is that you trap the lens in the back of the eye when you cause the my meiosis and that it can't migrate forward. You can still have complications. You can still get retinal detachment and bleeding in the eye, but it's less likely and less likely to get glaucoma than with your anterior lens luxation. Right. And then I think we have a few minutes, so we'll talk about glaucoma. So when we talk about glaucoma, we are either have primary or secondary glaucoma. So glaucoma is a rapid increase in the intraocular pressure in the eye, technically above 25, because 25 is the upper end of normal, um, without any other signs in the eye. For primary glaucoma, we're just talking about the dogs that were born with an abnormal irritable corneal drainage angle in the eye. When the pressure goes high, it causes a pressure degeneration of the retinal gift cells in the back of the eye. So they're not functioning because they're not getting the blood supply. And you usually see your episcleral injection, a fixed dilated pupil, and corneal edema. So this is just on the side progression of the retina degenerating with time. First line of treatment, if there's no other issues other than primary glaucoma is latanoprost. It's our strongest glaucoma treatment. Adult, for dogs and cats, it's not proven to be effective in cats, so we commonly use it in dogs. If the eye has a potential for vision, meaning that it just happened, there's a strong dazzle response, we wanna start giving medications and technically refer them over to talk about getting the medications further in the eye but you wanna start with one drop in the affected eye twice a day. Dorzolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor to decrease fluid production in the eye. You wanna start that one drop in the affected eye three times a day, but when we're talking about primary glaucoma, the other eye is most likely also going to show the same signs within the first six to 12 months. So we prophylactically start BID treatment of dorzolamide. I use dorzolamide with timolol as a compound or as a medication put together. Um, but if you're using them separately, you don't have to put the dorsolamide and the timolol in. Dorsolamide is the more important of the two drops, but I just like using them together. And if there is potential for vision, we start amlodipine. That protects your retinal cells from your reperfusion injury and can keep the eye as healthy as we can. Uh, there is a, in the ophthalmology book, there's a dose range that you want to use technically. But usually what we do is 0.625 mg once a day for a small dog. 1.25 for a medium or large breed dog, and then 2.5 mix once a day for a giant breed dog. If you do a round of drops and pressure does not come down at all, you can potentially consider doing IV mannitol. I only do anterior chamber paracentesis or aqueocentesis when I have exhausted my other measures because you will cause uveitis, and now you're dealing with glaucoma and uveitis. Uh, glaucoma surgery can be considered in an eye that has potential for vision, such as a laser procedure or a glaucoma valve procedure. So end stage glaucoma, you're either talking about removing the eyes, a prosthetic procedure, or a chemical injection procedure where I put genomycin into the vitreous. That has about an 85% success rate and is only done with sedation. So some owners like to opt for that. I'll just 
really briefly do sudden blindness. So whenever you have blindness, you're saying, is it blind because I see the issue, the retina is detached, the cat has hypertension, there's bleeding in the back of the eye, or does the eye look 100% normal? And I can't tell you why it's blind. If you see the reason, it has cataract, it has glaucoma, it has retinal detachment, you go with that. If you do not see the reason, then the answer is, if it's totally normal eye, the answer is either sudden acquired retinal degeneration syndrome, or the answer is that you have a neurologic disease, in which case you would do an electroretinogram to differentiate the two. So just other causes of acute blindness. Okay, these are adorable pictures. Hi, dad. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can figure out if anyone has any questions, how I can find them. Okay, so that is all that I had for right now. I wanted to leave some time if anyone has any questions. You can let me know. What can you use as a substitute for Shermer tear testing cats? So I mean, technically you can do a Shermer tear testing cats, but a cat can have a value of two or six and have a totally normal eye. So I typically just look at the eye. If the cat has had chronic issues with herpes virus and the eye just use, looks dull or irritated, I start them off with an artificial tear drop, just an over-the-counter artificial tear solution drop, usually about twice a day and see how they do over like three to four weeks. And if they get better, we can continue the drop twice or once a day. If there's no improvement, then we can talk about cyclosporin. But whenever we start cyclosporin in the eye, we always get worried that we can make more herpes flare-ups. So I always start with just a non-medicated artificial teardrop um, and just the evaluation of the eye to determine if it just looks blatantly dry. Okay, and then, so the next question, due to the high rate of metastasis, how aggressively do you recommend a nucleation of cats with suspicious iris pigmentation? If I have a cat that meets any of the criteria for iris melanoma, usually they don't just hit one criteria. Usually they hit more than one. So if I have a cat that hits the criteria, I recommend at least chest x-rays. And if those are clear, I recommend removal of the eye pretty aggressively if I see any of the criteria for malignancy. I try to get them to do chest x-rays and abdominal ultrasound first, but some owners prefer to wait until they get the biopsy report back, but I feel comfortable doing the chest x-rays first to make sure there's no contraindication for anesthesia. And if those are clear, I typically pretty quickly go to surgery. I'll wait a few more minutes if anyone else has questions. All right, so then there's another question, why gabapentin for pain control and not an NSAID? Um, for myself personally, if there's no inflammation around the eye and it's just truly that they have a high pressure in the eye or it's that there's something in the eye causing an issue or it's an indolent ulcer, I just find that gabapentin is, well, obviously I know that getting to be controlled drugs will make this harder, but I don't necessarily need the potential side effects of the NSAIDs orally. And I usually go with gabapentin just because I just truly need pain control and I don't have cases where I'm talking about an anti-inflammatory. If I do have a lot of inflammation around the eye, I will definitely start with a shorter course of an NSAID like carprofen and then add on gabapentin after that course has run, run its course. Why not serum for insulin ulcers? So there's just a study and serum was proven not to have any additional benefits. So it's not gonna hurt at all but it's not gonna have any benefits here. So technically you're using serum because it's an anticoagulinase and you don't have melting when you have an indolent ulcer. 
you just have your hemidesmosomes are not appropriately and effectively adhering to each other between the epithelium and the stroma. So again, serum's not gonna hurt, but there's no proven benefit to it because you're not trying to use it for what we're using it for the eye, which is the anticoagulase property. Are there any potential adverse effects or adverse reactions to serum? Um, I have never seen an issue with using serum. You can use poor serum. You can use different, you don't have to use the species serum on itself. So you can use dog serum on a cat. You can use horse serum on a dog or a cat. If you have a fractious cat that needs serum from an infected ulcer and you need to get the serum from someone else, it's typically well tolerated. The biggest issue with serum is that you wanna make sure that they're storing it appropriately. So it has to go in the fridge and that if they contaminate it in any way, they get rid of it because you don't want that to be potentiating the infection. So the only issue with serum is that they need to make sure they are handling it well, but typically for the eye itself, if they're handling it well, it does not have any adverse effects that we know of. What dosage do you use for gabapentin? So, I mean, I typically go somewhere between 10 to 20 mg per kg BID to TID, depending on the weight of the animal and how affected they are. But I usually go with at least 10 milligrams per kilogram and up to 20. I'm not afraid to go higher. I mean, so you can technically go up much higher than that. But for an eye issue, I typically try to say between 10 to 20 mg per kg twice to three times a day for gabapentin. All right, I'll give it another minute and then I think we'll be all done. All right, so I think if everyone's good and there's no questions, I'm going to sign off, but thank you all for coming. And let me know if you have any issues. I put my email address at the front of the presentation, but it's eyes, E-Y-E-S, at mlahvet.com. Everyone have a good night.